hello there. Um, so in, in the following slides, we will talk about um, a series of problems that actually we encountered in, um, in, in a set of different companies in which the technological part was not really uh, enough to solve the issues. So I am Andrea and I work in Red Hat Switzerland as a consultant. And I'm Raul Maikes. I work also in Red Hat Switzerland as a consultant. Um, so the slides are a bit better. Um, so basically, it, you know, like we, we, al we, we always talk about cooperation and cooperation is definitely an essential part for, for any kind of successful process or project. But um, most of the time, the word DevOps is actually abused because so we try to basically throw technology at the problem without solving it in a, in a more deep kind of uh, way. So this psychological aspect is often underestimated. And in companies in which, uh, which are very old, sco old school uh, and there is no cooperation whatsoever, there is a lot of garden keeping, and uh, there is no mean for automation or they don't want to automate. Um, there is a lot of fear of changes. Uh, it's actually an interesting playground when you try to do all these things because it's basically um, a, lot of, a lot of stuff that's kind of recurring in, in, in all of those companies. And um, basically the, what, what you're always see there is there is a silo organizer silo organization in which there is no sense of collaboration whatsoever uh, changing changings are impacting the teams uh, documentation is not there um, there is unnecessary complexity because there are an absolute lack of standards uh, the co the processes are very complicated and most of them are over engineered on purpose and there are not even coding standards that are set. So basically there is no kind of common ground across the teams and there is lack of automation. And it's normally because not only there is no software to automate, but there is no will to automate. And manual tasks are still, you know, it's something that still feel comfy for, for most of the people and there are a lot of technology gaps between the teams. So usually this organization which work uh, divided into separate uh, teams, it's uh, dedicated on a specific chapter of technology. And <coughs> uh, this uh, oft often, um, there is often uh, silos which uh, are teams, they don't, they don't talk to each other basically they uh, they work doing their things for their own department, not caring about other departments and how these changes will <coughs> impact other departments. And um, basically, when the, um, when they make a change and this breaks something in some that impacts other people, then uh, this generates uh, a reactive culture where the the changes are addressed after it happened instead of before. So so the other teams, they have to adapt their process, the scripts, etc. after the change has happened when it's too late. There is also a general, usually lack of standards. Um, for automation, Standardization is crucial. You cannot automate uh, uh, without uh, having standardization because it will be too, too way too complex to uh, to create the programs that handle the complexity. Uh, so we need the standards and naming conventions, and uh, they must reflect all information needed for. Uh, and for this, in if changes are made, they must be communicated in advance so that people can adapt their processes and uh, programs to these changes. Without enough time, there is no 
again going back to the previous uh, slide uh, there is no these uh, are reactive instead of proactive uh, actions of the slide and usually also there is a lack of clear communication sometimes i mean we can define i mean we can simplify communication to inputs and outputs what do you expect from me and what do i get from you kind of so so usually we found that uh, these inputs and outputs are not uh, for the technical part they are either not well documented or outdated so uh, maybe something happens and they didn't the team responsible for that didn't update the documentation so the other teams they they found out when the things doesn't work as expected uh, also it happens with uh, processes sometimes you need to run after people uh, see who knows what uh, are the steps the right steps to do certain things so so this is also a big problem for automating there is also lack of uh, feeling of ownership some um, many departments they will think okay this is my job and i don't care if i make a change to my area i don't care if it's gonna break uh, somebody else's script it's not my problem and uh, this is uh, very bad because uh, it just makes a lot of people frustrated because they will they will i mean they will see their their processes break and sometimes they get management attention and then uh, we can enter into the blame game who is who is responsible for this and so and so so all this again feedbacks into the silo problem the the people become upset with each other let's say and then they don't want to work together one of one of the main issues that uh, we actually saw in a lot of uh, those organizations is actually that uh, the fear of changes. So basically, uh, even though you know the the engineer the, the engineers might have will to change, but basically, when they get into the problem and they actually need to change the stuff, uh, and they basically work a lot with uh, specific technology, the problem that they found is that basically they don't want to change it because they're scared that that technology could replace them. So um, even though they, have, they do have the, the technical background, they don't want to touch it because simply they're scared of you know, what can possibly happen. And even though um, business strategy is like automate at every cost everything, the 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 problem that uh, we normally encounter is that stability is weak. So basically, the servers have been you know uh, manned manually. Uh, there is no automation. There were no standards again. So um, basically, um, you know, like mm, the controls are at a, are at the bare minimum. So basically, you have people messing around with the stuff. They don't go through their LDAP account. They, they have like, you know, a common root account, whatever. So you can't actually track what they do. Uh, priorities are not set because of lack of communication again. So people don't communicate to each other. They have a lot of stuff to do. They just do it one thing after the other. There is no, you know, no organization, no, uh, no kind of uh, common goal. So stuff is going to break. And in this situation, it's extremely hard to test. And that's something that you definitely want to do because without testing, you don't know if that stuff is going to work. And the, the problem is that the first time they try to apply automation is that you, know, you have something not, uh, not automated and it's messy. You automate the mess. It starts to be an even bigger mess. Bigger mess. So basically what happens is that um, some people are very good at it so they start to automate, break things, don't communicate to the other. The other ones don't know the new technology. They don't put the ends on the new technology. They can't fix it. So plus there is a fragmented ownership because you know that guy on that desk knows how to automate, knows the stuff, so he's going to do it. 
if he gets sick, nobody's gonna touch that stuff. So if it's, if it's broken, it will fix it when it's back. And um, yeah, as I said, automating this kind of, in this kind of messy environments, uh, it's just getting more messy. And this brings to a, basically to an evil circle, which in which the company needs something, the engineer engineering receives the request, starts a sort of a manual process that is half manual, half automated, uh, no, one, no one knows exactly who is doing what, and then when this process is done, stuff needs to be checked. It's probably broken and it needs to be redone again. So management gets upset and uh, the evil circle starts. Um, and so how did we solve the challenges uh, on both um, human side and technical side? So <coughs> collaboration and openness is nice, but uh, unfortunately we, we humans, we get uh, moody, unstable, sometimes depending on the people. So there should be some technical means to, to prevent uh, human errors and also to prevent accidental sabotage by lack of interest or just because somebody doesn't like some other person and so on. So what we could use to solve this technical challenge is, uh, in so we have uh, Ansible Tower, we we use it uh, very often for um, managing playbooks. Uh, I mean, it's a good platform for engineers to work together. Uh, we can manage credentials without, uh, I mean, we can let the other engineers to use some credentials without letting them know the credentials themselves. They just, we can just use it, but they cannot see it. Uh, we can also use <coughs> cloud forms for the UI. It's very easy to, prepare uh, intelligent service dialogs and uh, can be simplified, tailor-made to the user experience. So if a user uh, is from department X and it only needs to see certain operations, it will only see that operations and nothing else. Uh, at the same time, other people from other department will see other things. And uh, of course we should use uh, uh, some infrastructure to test mean to, to do automated testing. Uh, this is to make sure that when we do changes, they don't break the existing, the existing uh, uh, workflow. Um, so <coughs> automation is actually uh, very good, but um, we, you all, y we should always make sure that it's well planned and how, how do I mean with that? Is that basically, if you start to automate in some somewhere in which uh, you have no automation, no pre-existing automation, you have to plan what are the tasks and you have to have a vision on how those tasks should look like. Because if you don't have that vision, you're going to do just something that probably is not gonna work together with, with the rest of the infrastructure. So targeting, solve a problem, go to the next and automate wherever possible. Uh, basically, I mean, the aim would, should be that you touch, you press a button, everything spins, and everything is automated because you definitely wanna go out of the blaming circle. So you don't wanna have, uh, you know, engineers that touch the things and they don't know what they're doing and then they break it for another team and they maybe use the same login credential to get in so automating would solve this problem. So basically the mindset should be there, either, either it's automated or it's, it's not happening. So um, Ansible, in my opinion, it's a great tool for that uh, because it's very easy to onboard people. So if you compare it with, for instance, Puppet, which, I mean, we're not comparing Apple with Apple because uh, Puppet is a much more complicated thing, but Ansible is very easy to onboard because it's just, you know, it's just some bunch of YAML files. There are a lot of, a um, lot of uh, prepare packages on the Ansible Galaxy, so it's, 
it's, it's a great tool for that. And um, well, the, the most important thing is that we had to do is basically convincing people that the best thing to go would, would be automate, test, check, repeat. And this, this is normally gonna work pretty well, but it takes a lot of time to, to actually um, make it. So uh, <laughs> we, we used to have a demo, but unfortunately internet is very slow. So basically every time we click, it takes about 10 minutes. So <laughs> I guess we're gonna skip that because <laughs> there is a lot of clicking around and that's a bit of a pity. And yeah. So another important thing is uh, to provide a simple user interface. So the, I mean, if people can uh, request uh, what they want uh, with a simple user interface instead of having to send emails or fill forms, I mean, long forms and, and uh, contact people and so on, they will be much more happy and willing to, to, to do it, I mean, to use it. And uh, also, one thing is that when you <coughs> create a user interface, it needs to be uh, difficult for people to 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 do workarounds. So the you should use you should be using like uh, verify the inputs and uh, also providing letting the user choose only what they should use and not everything else. This uh, also. Uh, prevents them from uh, selecting the wrong thing and having all wrong and then, you know, going back uh, to, to a step one. Um, keeping it simple is also very important because when things get too complex, people, especially people who are new to it, they will, they will become just, uh, I don't want to, I don't want to do this, I want somebody to do it for me. And um, yeah, well, as I say, validate the inputs, don't make rules for mistakes. Uh, well there is lots of demo, <laughs> but then. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Uh, just adding something to, to, the, to, the, to, the, to, the, to the above. Uh, it's like, it's basically, if you make stuff very complicated, it's like uh, when you try to uh, close the cat in, in, in the room, and then you start to put, um, Sm even smaller, uh, you know, uh, crates to, m to make the cat pass, it will, it will go around. What I want to say is that if you make stuff very complicated, people uh, are not gonna use it. So the simple it is, the more people uh, will, be, will be using this, uh, this. And one very important thing is that every step you do, no matter how simple it is, it, uh, it it has to be replicable. So basically, you you have to um, you have to do like some kind of automation in that helps you replicate the steps at any point. It is expensive because it takes normally a lot of time. Uh, it scares away people at the beginning because if they're used to uh, just do the stuff, normally uh, when they start to automate, they say, "Ah, why should I spend half an hour?" to automate this because I can make it in five minutes. Uh, the problem is that what we try to make them understand is that basically those five minutes replicated for the entire data center, which you have maybe 500 servers, is much more than half an hour. And the testing of all this is, is, is expensive too because basically you have to replicate your infrastructure so now you have tools like uh, Creo or Docker or Vagrant boxes um, that you can you know, easily spin and destroy. It's never gonna be uh, exactly the same kind of thing that you have in the data center, but it's, it's really, it uh, can, can get pretty close and it's absolutely necessary because when you test a lot, you avoid the mess. Uh, as much as we can approach the problem uh, from a technical standpoint, if people are not willing to to do it, I mean, there's no nothing you can do. So you 
you need to change the attitude of uh, people. Yeah. Um, so basically, yeah, I mean, throwing technology at the problem is not only the is not the only solution you have, because uh, there is something more needed. Because basically, if you do not communicate, if you do not do not build standards, if you don't make people feel responsible, and that's very, very important, uh, nothing is gonna happen. Like, uh, having the people being accountable for what they do, it's actually the most important thing you can do in your company, because when people feel responsible for what they do, they try to care about it, and if they care about it, the performance are growing sky high. And um, standardization helps a lot with that, because if you find a common ground among those people uh, to collaborate and you know being able to read what someone else writes uh, actually helps a lot and standardization is indispensable for this. And open communication is also something that is very, very important, um, not only in terms of you know like the buzzword of the open communication framework, but really being able to communicate with the team is core it's absolutely important because there is no agile process, there is no DevOps if, if you do not communicate. And this, in this kind of companies, it's, it's basically the main issue. You go to a company in which, you know, the, the infrastructure or the organization is very tight, you can't actually talk with the people, uh, you can't talk with your boss, you can't tell your boss that you failed, that you failed and that's, that's very important because if you can do that, then the stuff gets much, much easier. Um, and so to have a clear structured process um, is uh, helpful because it avoids misunderstanding. <coughs> um, so people should know what they, they should do and uh, and so people should uh, participate in this, in defining these processes. I mean, if when, it's, uh, when things are not clear, it's the worst because people just uh, can divert uh, and then you, you get a single process and becomes something that it depends to who you talk with. Yeah, standardization again. Uh, when, when you define the standards, you avoid ambiguity. And if you avoid that, you, um, you avoid the guesswork. So if everything is standard, there is no reason to argue because you can just follow wha what you set as a standard. And it normally guarantees a very high quality and very high productivity. And if the productivity is high, the morale will be high as well. So people will be happy because they see that the stuff actually works, and it works good, because having stuff that doesn't work is extremely frustrati frustrating. <coughs> um, well, the problem is, who owns the topics? And how do we deal with this um, ownership problems? So one simple thing you can do is to to see where I mean where the complexity is. So if if the I mean if to generate the inputs, you need to have a lot of inside knowledge of the product or area, and this inside knowledge is only on, for example, here on Team B. Then Team B should take the responsibility for this part. But unfortunately, sometimes it's not so um, simple. So well. Sometimes there are multiple teams involved, and uh, then uh, what you can do is just to to um, split into different into different parts. So, for example, if you use Ansible, you can create different playbooks for each purpose, and that's it. And uh, it's very important to be nice and to to talk with people and not be mean with other teams, because uh, this is this happens uh, often that. Uh, again, the human part, uh, some people don't like other people and then they try to 
kind of sabotage. So the, it's important to have a good environment or at least somebody who is making sure that uh, to diffuse all this uh, animosity between the teams. So um, at the end, how, how, how did we implement, uh, the, uh, how do, do we normally implement the CI-CD model? Uh, how can you actually test infrastructure uh, and avoid failing when you go in production? So uh, that's, you know, it's just an example, uh, but I, I found out that it actually works pretty good. Um, so for automation, uh, you know, uh, we work for Red Hat, so <laughs> we, we, we use Ansible. And um, uh, Ansible has this uh, very fancy thing uh, that is a sort of a GUI that is called Ansible Tower that actually can automate automation processes. And in there is the concept of the team and you can actually connect it to, to your LDAP. So you have an LDAP directory, you have different teams, those teams have def different permissions. And what, what I normally try to do is map those permissions to the same permission in, in the Git repository. So, so that each team owns his own modules, can contribute to others, but you always know who is touching what. And that's absolutely um, super important. Now, uh, when you write Ansible roles, uh, stuff can, can get pretty complicated to test because normally, you know, YAML linting is not enough. So what we use is Molecule. Molecule is a Python library that which is extremely cool in which, um, in which basically you can define what kind of test the infrastructure should do and it uses um, it uses some kind of testing frameworks that are written in Python in which you can actually assert what you did. Example, you're installing Nginx, you want Nginx to listen on port 80 and you write a playbook for that. So basically what you do is writing a Python script that says connect to this machine, check if port 80 is open. And this, if this happens and your guys can actually use it on their laptop. So um, we normally enforce it with a, with, you know, with a, with a post-commit check, but uh, a pre-commit check. Uh, but um, the, the cool thing about it is that it's written in Python, uses the same libraries as uh, Ansible. So basically you can test on your laptop whether this stuff is gonna work or not. And the cool thing is that it works with Docker and it works with uh, Vagrant. So you can actually test uh, on both cases, uh, if you're using containers or virtual machines. And um, well, the, um, the other tool we use quite a lot is Jenkins. Jenkins is pretty much everywhere. So I believe that most of you are confident with it. And uh, what we use Jenkins for um, is basically for triggering two different things. One is a uh, satellite that can be connected to Rev or whatever to spin a Linux virtual machine, do all the testing, uh, try all the roles, try all the playbooks because Molecule can't test playbooks, can only test actually uh, actual roles. So basically to, to check everything, we, we spin up a virtual machine, we test all we've, ro all we've brought in the, in the Ansible roles and uh, then we use Molecule to check everything on Docker, so for sanity check, so that uh, basically each, doc, uh, each Ansible role is tested, is tested individually and then all together. And there is this one tool that uh, not a lot of people I, I, I found out uh, actually know. Um, it's, it's called server spec. That's a great thing. Uh, in which basically you can define how your machine should look like after you do automation. Has been written by the guys at Ceph, uh, no sorry, uh, Chef, uh, the, the other automation platform. Uh, can work pretty well with Puppet too. In one of our customers we had both Puppet and Ansible. So basically what it does is describing uh, how the, 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 
machine should look like. So you write your server specifications, you test all your playbooks against this, you take the result and you check with server spec if it's what you were expecting that you get. So basically, you can loop in this thing and try to find out if all the servers will be on the same state because Ansible is not a state machine. So it doesn't enforce the state, it just applies the playbooks one after the other. Instead, Puppet uh, um, uh, generates a state. So basically, it compiles the state and then applies the old state to the machine. And in this, they are substantially different. So sometimes it's very easy to use Ansible because you know it just does the stuff one after the other. But on the other end, you can't really check if what you get is what you were expecting because it's hard to test. This guy solves the problem because you can actually generate uh, gathering facts and check how the server looks like and check if it's what you were expecting. So in case in which uh, you also have like something else running there, like Puppet for instance, or Chef, that is a pre-existing uh, automation model, you can still use server spec to compare the results. So it's an extremely powerful thing and you can integrate it with, um, with a Ruby CI CD software that is called Kitchen CI. Unfortunately, it's not in the, um, in the schema, but you can use Kitchen CI to automate even this. So the result gathering and the test with server spec. So if everything works, server spec uh, or Kitchen CI in that case, or Jenkins or whatever you're using, gives you the thumbs up, it's fine. Ansible, Ansible core, which will be triggered by An Ansible tower, will go through the server farm and apply all the changes. Like this, you preserve the ownership of each, of each role. You know who is touching what. The checks are enforced on your laptop and after the commit on Git. Jenkins will take care of the rest. Server spec will check that what you did is actually what you wanted to do and then Ansible will do the rest. And this I found out that actually, I did it for initially for one customer and I figured out that actually it's pretty, it's pretty good. It's a pretty general model and it normally works pretty well. So try it out. J just want to add one thing, is that many Ansible modules, they, they do a stateful and you can also do testing into the into the playbook. So, um, well, what, what did we learn for all this? Um, first, technology only, it's, it's not gonna solve the problem. So, um, before you apply any technology change in a company, especially old school companies, because you know, if you have 10 people in your startup, you normally, I mean, you should be able to <laughs> talk and come up with a solution. Um, and technology change won't fix anything if there is a culture, if there isn't a culture change within it. And uh, to achieve results, you have to achieve both. You have to, to kind of, uh, grow the culture of your company uh, with the technology. And um, normally using an open collaboration framework can make technologies much more effective. Um, the, the open collaboration framework would say that it's a, it's a system for, you know, innovating. Now with this, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that you should go by the book and just follow what they say in the, in the open collaboration framework. But uh, having a look at it, it's, it's pretty good because uh, there is a lot of uh, good ideas uh, to implement stuff. Uh, also investing time in making things uh, go smooth between the different teams pays off because again, if uh, people don't want to work together, it's very difficult to achieve things. I mean, there will be a lot of sabotage. 
And uh, also, I mean, you when you go to work for a company, you you want to have a bad time, right? I mean, you want to to enjoy what you do and so on. So it's uh, it's good to to m try to make people settle their differences and so on. And um, well, to settle those differences, you have to you have to be fair. Basically, um, if you want, so what, what we've seen is that uh, if, if the company or the management wasn't fair with the employees, they, were, they would have sabotaged it. So if you want to avoid this, you should be kind of fair with, uh, with the guys uh, are working with you. Um. Again, try to automate uh, as much as possible because uh, if you automate uh, your task and and not only your task, I mean, you participate in automating the whole process, then uh, you will have more time to do engineering. So uh, I think most people don't enjoy doing repetitive tasks. I mean, most people are in this job to, to create new things and do, I mean, think and create solutions and not um, doing copy paste and things like that so if you uh, if you automate you can you can uh, focus more on this kind of work instead of repetitive things and uh, also the if you leave the you make uh, your users easy to, to request your services without having to contact you and send emails to people and so on. I mean, if you also make it uh, easy with a user interface, also you will get uh, less disruption on your daily work. Yes. Um, so uh, saving times automating means uh, that you don't only have more time to build better things, uh, but this time uh, should be invested in training because uh, even if it's, I mean, uh, it doesn't need to be like, you know, that you go in a super expensive training or whatever, but uh, gathering the teams together and having them talk about what they're doing <laughs> and the technology they're using and all the kind of stuff they do, even if it's, you know, completely unrelated, um, it's normally very beneficial for everybody because again, uh, you can't achieve any kind of goal if you don't have communication inside a company. And uh, this is uh, something that, uh, in my opinion, uh, was like the most important learning in, in all those companies we went through, that if the people are not nice to each other, if the people don't wanna share what they do, if people do not communicate, nothing is gonna happen. And the, you know, like the stuff will <laughs> remain dead, basically. Um, thank you a lot. And do you have any question? Yeah. Uh, well, some of them, yes. I mean, it's it's not a specific company. It's it's more like you know a generic kind of thing. But uh, some some of them they try. Some, some of them, they actually claim to be agile, but in practice, they are not. I mean, it's just uh, for the checklist. Ba they basically use Jira. <laughs> 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 That's as uh, agile as they get. Any other question? You talk with the people. It's so uh, a lot of companies. Uh, they, so we have some frameworks uh, in Reddit to, to talk to people. And, um, but uh, normally uh, companies, in, in companies like, I, I found very effective workshopping stuff. So if you go there and you want to, to pitch your idea, showing what is your idea, it's actually very, very effective. So just, you know, gather people together, try to workshop something uh, well, if 
people get along, they get along. Otherwise, you know, you can't change people's mind that much. Uh, but uh, normally, you know, being nice to people and uh, try to try to pitch your ideas is actually an effective way, or that's what I found to be effective. Uh, usually, when you are a consultant, uh, you go there and you start meeting people and you start getting the feeling of how they. <coughs> How is the politics inside the company, basically? And based on that, uh, you need to, well, you can talk to people, you can talk to management, and try to make uh, them understand that if basically if they don't work together, if this project maybe is going to take ages and uh, it's not going to work at the end. So uh, basically, it's just talking and, uh, and seeing, observing what happens inside the company. Any other question? Yeah. Uh, Sorry, say it again. Well, that's a tough one. <laughs> um, so I, I don't have I don't have uh, a, a very you know good way to to actually motivate people, or I don't have a solution for that. I don't think there there is thing like one size fit for all I think it depends on people um, again again I think uh, you know like investing on their education for instance is one thing so I like a lot to be you know to to learn new things for instance so I'm very motivated when the company allows me to um, get more knowledge another thing could be you know team building events this is also a great thing I mean, some people like it, some people don't. But at the end, uh, I mean, I, I have pretty good memories of companies that uh, made made us do like some kind of cool team events. Uh, also, I mean, um, you can let them get more involved and like um, get them to participate if they want. I mean, uh, allow them to be able to raise their voice and to to feed, no, not just, uh, I mean, uh, like if you are a manager and you are like, this has to be my way or no way, this, this will make people like, very like, very demotivated. So if you make a more, make the environment more participative between all the people, then I think they, most people, they will feel more motivated to work. Anyone else? So what uh, what I normally do, it's again uh, taking like you know the responsibles for for the team, get them together in a room, make them stick their head together, come up with a standard, and again it's it's all about talking. I mean at the end, you have to communicate the things. Uh, Yeah, definitely. I, I wouldn't say blame, but just let them know that it's not right. I mean, <laughs> no, not uh, too much because if you, if you, I mean, if you blame people too much, they at the end may, they may feel like, oh, uh, this is not for me, and you know, they, uh, yeah, they, they won't, they won't get uh, to the learning curve. I mean, they will pass. They will pass. So normally, what happens is that I have to lower quite a bit. The, the strict the strictness of the checks but you know like at least sanity check and this kind of stuff you know this this is easy to do and again uh, I mean if you write ansible code I firmly recommend using molecule because it's it does does basically YAML linting ansible linting testing and all this kind of stuff it's pretty good at that um, yeah you you always have to set the bar at a certain point because otherwise you know people go crazy uh, it's like when you write C code and you uh, you put dash dash warning all and pedantic, <laughs> you're not gonna compile anything, right? <laughs> Anyone else?
so I, I normally speak with them very clearly and I tell them how much time do you spend a day to do the same task? Wouldn't you rather do it once properly? And uh, one thing is, so, and this is the nice way. There is a bad way, which is enforcing that everything is not automated. It's scratched by the automation itself. So like Puppet, for instance, is very good at this because you can define, look, the machine has to look like this. If you touch it elsewhere, Puppet run scratched again. I mean, you, you also need to have the management to be on board because if they, I mean, <coughs> some people will be motivated, but other people will think, okay, I'm, I'm management is pushing me to do this and uh, I have to automate, I don't have time. So there has to be also management support because at the end, uh, you know, they control. Last question. Last question. Anyone? So it's, I mean, in my experience, it's normally the network team that has, uh, that doesn't want to automate much because uh, it's very hard to test. For instance, I mean, if you want to apply rules on a firewall and you do it in an automated way, the rule is wrong, you kick your company out, right? So I, I normally advise to start with small things and if it's very a very difficult area like networking, for example, firewalling, then it might, it might even make sense that they keep doing some stuff manually because they want the double checks because if it is if it is really uh, at that at that particular area in which you can get uh pretty bad you know like um it can get pretty bad if if you uh automate it wrong i think that um it's probably easier to tell them like look take your time but do it proper of course i mean you should you know push them a bit but uh, in some specific areas, I can understand that it's actually pretty complicated. Yeah, it's, um, it, it has to be, I mean, <coughs> management has to consider that as the long-term goal to get everybody to be used to automate. And also I think it's useful if uh, there is a dedicated team or, the, or yeah, to, to be like uh, um, educating people on uh, automating and also like make them i mean make make people understand that i mean normally what i see in it is that everybody is super loaded with things and uh, automating actually is not gonna replace your job because it changes constantly and if you it's better if you are like less stressed and uh, you you can like do engineering as, as I mentioned before, than if you are manually think doing things and you know, it's, I think it's, it takes time. Well, I guess we're done. Uh, thanks a lot again. Thank you. And uh, have a good lunch.